doesn't mean that someone's asking for reparation, but what I am saying is that America has had three very interesting opportunities to have truth and reconciliation. One opportunity was during the whole Constitutional Congress period where they were grappling with what it meant to be free, what it meant to be civically engaged, they being the founding fathers, but they could not find it in their hearts. As visionaries they were, they could not find it in their hearts to include poor white people. They could not find it in their hearts to include women. They could not find it in their hearts to include black people, let's free slaves. They could not find it in their hearts to include Native Americans. And so it was a wasted opportunity. We know, because we're Americans in this room, the second opportunity was during something called the Civil War, particularly that period after the Civil War called Reconstruction, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, which was an opportunity, an effort, to get more people civically engaged. Reconstruction went from 1865 to 1877. Don't take my word for it, look it up. Look it up. You know, but we also know during that period of, of great transformation and change in this country of institutions like the Freedmen's Bureau, of the building of historically black colleges like Howard University and other schools, it was also this kind of terrorism that was sweeping through this country. Coming, around, coming out of places like Indiana eventually, called the Ku Klux Klan. And by 1877, that opportunity was lost. And we know the third opportunity was during the Civil Rights Movement. Because what the Civil Rights Movement really was, think about it, we're talking about civic engagement, it was supposed to be a conversation about the engagement of all people in the democratic process. You all see how we're sitting around in this room today, nice and comfortable and civil with each other. It's no big deal that we might be of different backgrounds. Ask yourself a really basic question, a rhetorical question. What would this country look like, and how would we be, be behaving right now if the Civil Rights Movement had never happened? It had never happened. That's what I'm talking about when I say that we have to become civically and politically engaged. We have to read. We have to study. We need to know the country that we're claiming. We need to know it. We need to know it inside out. We need to know our families inside out. You know, a lot of times people will talk about diversity and multiculturalism. And I always say to people, how are you going to come to the table of diversity and multiculturalism? You don't even know who you are. What are you going to bring to the table? What are you going to bring to the table? What's going to be the conversation? We can't, we can't continue to just bring food to the table. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be real, honest dialogue. When I talk about how we become more civically, politically engaged, I also recommend, sisters and brothers, as I said earlier, that we do some extensive travel. Please travel around the country. I will even start with my home city in New York City. People in Brooklyn don't go to Manhattan. People in Manhattan don't go to Queens. People in Queens don't go to the Bronx. I'm like, wait a minute, we all live in New York. Then all of New York City, they think New Jersey's on the other side, but they think it's where Alaska is. <laughs> Jersey, I'm not, excuse me, I'm not going to Jersey. Why limit yourself like that? You know, part of being civically engaged is a willingness to get out of your comfort zone and go someplace you've never been before. You know, how many of us, and I'm sure this room is sophisticated, how many of us have been out of the country? And I don't, not counting Jamaica or the Bahamas. Okay. And not just calling tourist trips. One of the best things you can do is not take a tourist trip, but actually go where the people are in any given country. You know, that is important too. I think we have to do travel, travel, travel. I'm, I'm ashamed to admit, the first time I went out of the country many, many years ago was to Paris, France. You know, I was happy to go because I got to go to a conference about American expatriates who had, you know, went to move to Paris. It was exciting, you know. And I get there, and I realize that I had flunked French my freshman year at Rutgers University. And being the narrow-minded American I was at the time, I was demanding that the French speak English. And anyone's ever been to France, no, the French ain't trying to speak no English. And the only place that I could go, and the only word I could say was free, as in French fries, at McDonald's. And that's what I did. But I got such an education over those two weeks because I realized, you know, don't stop demanding the world to come to you. You go to the world. You go to the world. We have to travel. Travel throughout America, travel overseas. We've got to become more critical thinkers. I mean, you know, what can we say? I, I don't care if you're liberal or conservative. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. I don't see how you all can see, can't see, that the war in Iraq is a doomed war at this point. My Republican friends say it, my Democratic friends say it. You know, we've lost over 4,000 American lives. We've, you know, 30,000 or so folks have been wounded, our soldiers, and I have several friends who've been back and forth to the Gulf Coast at this point. You know, no one in sight. 
you know, this morning I asked the students if anyone knew where Bin Laden was, and one student said he Googled Bin Laden, and he thinks that Bin Laden is in New York City at this point. <laughs> and, I mean, this is, this is ridiculous, you know? And the real issue becomes, okay, what is Halliburton exactly? You know, what is Dick Cheney's long-term relationship to Halliburton, including once being the CEO of Halliburton? Does this thing really have to do with freedom for Iraq and Afghanistan and for the Middle East, or is this about oil and money? You all feel where I'm going with this? Is there a connection to the Wall Street bailout, super wealthy being taken care of, and the wealthy fighting this war overseas? And then on top of that, as I was flying into Indiana yesterday, I'm sitting next to some young soldiers, and the thing that's striking to me is there's, no, there's not been a need for a draft in this country for a good 30 something years or so. And let me make it very clear, I support our troops 1,000%. Let me make it also very clear, many members of my family have been in the United States military, many of them, you know? But it's interesting to me that most of the soldiers that I encounter, be they white, black, Latino, Asian, Native American, male or female, oftentimes come from rural environments and poor working class, or they come from inner city or hood environments, poor, working class. And so it's almost like it's an economic draft. It's almost like my cousin and I, Anthony, in 1984, 85, when we decided, okay, we're 18 years old now, what the heck are we gonna do with our lives? We have no money, we have no hope. I luckily got a financial aid package and I went to Rutgers University. My cousin joined the military. Because the military provided an opportunity for him to get college credits. The military gave him an opportunity to pick up some skills. And it gave him an opportunity to do what I just suggested we all do, travel. That's why he joined the military. He did not join the military to fight a war that he could not even comprehend, you know? And so when I say become critical thinkers, you know, let's be very critical about what's going on. I, I suggest to everyone that we go back and read two very important speeches. One is President Eisenhower's exit speech as he was leaving the White House in 1961 where he talked about the military industrial complex. And let's not forget that Eisenhower was a Republican who was also a general, a heroic general in World War II. So who was better qualified to talk about the military industrial complex than a former soldier who also happened to have been the President of the United States? He talked about it. That's 1961. And then you fast forward six years to Dr. King, a great Christian minister who talked about the Vietnam War and how we were sending poor blacks and poor whites to go fight poor yellow people in a place called Vietnam. Those are two speeches I recommend that you all check out. You don't have to agree with everything they said, but they're from two different types of people. One, a general Republican, another, a left-leaning Christian minister. But they both were saying the same exact things. How do we become civically engaged? We have to join an organization. How many people out there are in our organizations? So, so important. And I want to stress to people, please join an organization outside of your church. Don't let it just be your church group. I go to uh, uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church, as you know, in, in Brooklyn, New York, Mr. Blewett. And one of the things that's interesting to me, I love my church. I think it's a great church. It's a very civically engaged church. But there are some people in my church, no disrespect, who are there four or five times a week. And I say to them, to me, as a Christian, you know, I want to be more Christ-like. I think the real work is outside these four walls. Why do I have to come here and be a part of this club and that club and this club and that club? The only people I'm learning how to relate to are the people inside these walls. When the real work needs to happen in the projects, the real work needs to happen in the rural areas, the real work needs to happen on these college campuses, why should I just limit myself to this church? Join an organization outside your religious institution. If you don't like the organization that exists, start an organization. What we also need, our mentors, mentors, mentors. That's how you become civically engaged. College students here, if you have the time, I see some younger people in this room. I can't even tell you, as a young man growing up back in the day, who did not grow up with a father, you know, barely saw any men around. My entire household was woman run. How desperately, desperately, I needed to see some male energy around me. And because I did not, I really believe it's one of the reasons why I ended up getting in trouble with the police as a teenager. One of the reasons why I had a very bad and violent temper, you know, because I had no one giving me an alternative example of manhood. You all feel where I'm going with this? And one of the worst things we can do is condemn young people. Look at how they dress. Look at how they talk. Listen to their music. Look at Britney Spears. Look at Paris Hilton. Look at T.I. Y'all know what we say. Yet we don't have any relationship with young people. We talk bad about them. We don't even know anything about them. We don't know what they're into. We don't know their culture, anything like that. 
mentorship is there. And I'm going to say to you all, someone who mentors, God knows how many dozens of young people in New York City, not only am I teaching them a lot of things that I've learned, I'm sort of teaching them to avoid some of the mistakes that I made, but they're also teaching me because a young person born in 1990 or 89 or 92 or 95 has a very different perspective on the world than if you're born in 66 or 56 or 46. There are things that he or she can learn from you, but there are things you also can learn from that young person just by mentoring that young person. You can start with learning how to check your email. 